Um, to start off, so we're about two, two, three weeks from the midpoint of sine die and when you guys gavel back in to the legislature. So there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of buzz. There's always buzz about when the Democrats are going to take back at least the Texas House of Representatives, and I think there's a lot more chatter about that, um, mainly because of the gains y'all made uh, the, last, the last session. You guys picked up 12, 12 seats, so you guys are, is it nine, nine away? Nine away from taking control of the House for the first time in a really, really long time. Um, but I just want to talk realistically on what you guys think the prospects are. I know you guys all obviously hope that happens, seeing as how you're from, you're from that party. But it's, it's not only gaining those nine seats, it's also holding on to the 12 that you picked up. And from what I understand, there's, there's about five or six of those that were won or decided by 3.5 percentage points or less. So um, that's, that's also a challenge for you all. So, I mean, realistic prospects of the way you guys are seeing. I mean, we just had a special election that a lot of people thought was going to go to the Dem side. It, it didn't in the landslide. So um, I'll, start, I'll start with you and ask you about that most recent House race. I mean, is that indicative of the, of the work that you guys have to do, or do you think that was just kind of an outlier there? I think it's uh, an outlier. I think that's a strong Democratic, I mean, Republican district. Um, as a former chair of the House Democratic Campaign Committee, the last two election cycles, uh, we've seen Democrats pick up uh, a total of 15 seats, uh, 12 in the last election cycle, and then three previously. Um, and I think the most important ingredient um, in that is one: you got to you got to field candidates that represent the district, that 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 uh, understand the district that's from the district. Number one, and and we did a good job uh, reaching out to candidates and and interviewing candidates uh, well in advance of, of their filing. Number two, it's the issues. And I think that when you focus on things that are not um, extreme issues, that are political issues, um, when you're focused on things such as property tax reform, investments in education, uh, both uh, 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 K through 12 as well as uh, higher ed, when you're focusing on, on jobs in the economy and focusing on infrastructure, things that I think te mainstream Texans care about, uh, that resonates uh, with Republican and Democratic voters. Is it, isn't sort of going to an extreme working for a Republican so far, though? I mean, do you think they're going to stop that tack and, and go to the center? Or I mean, anybody else want to? I think we saw that last session. No, I mean, we, we were in this room prior to heading to legislative session, and we talked about whether elections have consequences. And the prediction from this stage, from these members, was you were going to see a focus on issues like public education, uh, you know, the, the, the issues that Democrats have been attempting to address for over a decade, even though we're not in the majority. And so that was the answer from leadership was to turn around and pay attention to these issues. So we're talking about classrooms versus, you know, instead of bathrooms, which is what we did the prior session of that. So yeah, elections have consequences. We pivot, I mean, look at the session. I know there's been some political uh, intrigue post-session, but during session, I, I, what, whatever I, I, do you mean? I, I, well, we, we don't have to go into that, but uh, you know, during session, you, you saw a collaborative uh, effort. You saw Democrats chair major committees. Uh, you you know, you saw uh, you saw leadership be responsive to issues that matter to our community and people collaborating and working together and and and, and uh, avoiding, for the most part, not not 100 percent, but avoiding these incendiary issues that divide people. Uh, that was the result of electing 12 Democrats to the Texas House. Uh, we only move that further. We only advance that further if we're success more, more successful in 2020. With, with, with yes, sir, go ahead. Well, let, let, me, let me add that it's not just 12 seats in the House. We also gained two seats in the Senate. Right. And we're still in the minority in the Senate, but uh, we expect to pick up the San Antonio seat that we lost uh, last time around. And so that's going to, uh, to make the, the Senate a little bit more uh, consensus building atmosphere, I hope, other than that the Lieutenant Governor has already announced that he's willing to drop the rules again, right. change them, sure. so that it's difficult for Democrats to, to uh, have any kind of influence on major uh, legislation. Uh, the, the, we, we, to your question about do we really expect to gain seats, uh, I think the midterm elections in 2018 that caused us to gain two seats in the Senate uh, and 12 in the House are, are sending a loud message about the electorate feeling that there needs to be some changes in the way we do business in the Capitol. And the fact that the governor, uh, as I read in the paper last week, has decided that he's going to go out on the campaign trail on behalf of not only congressional candidates, but I think I read four or so right. 
House members tells you how concerned the Republican leadership is about uh, losing control of the House. And I'm, I'm very optimistic that they are going to lose control of the House. Uh, Representative Moody mentioned that the post-session scandal, obviously that the Speaker, uh, you know, got in some trouble. He was, you know, caught on tape, you know, denigrating some of his House members. He has since said he's, you know, he's bowing out. He's not going to resign. But Mary, do you think that that's going to... And, and I asked this question. I know that, you know, and I know, Representative Moody, you said, look, you don't, you don't celebrate in somebody else's pain. You're not going to sort of piggyback on, on the scandals that, it's, that are plaguing the Republican Party. But... It, is it realistic that that could affect people's minds when they go to the ballot box? I mean, do you think, or is that too much inside baseball, Mary? I think that everything does impact elections, but I think it's very much inside baseball. If I go down to my district and I ask them, what's happening in the speaker's situation, I would argue that most of them don't know. Um, and I think that's because a lot of it is removed from the realities of what actually happened during session. They may not know what happened with the speaker's situation, but they do know that our local public schools got more money this session. Right. They do know that we are actually starting to get things done. They do know we started to work a little bit on some property tax stuff. So what they really care about is their daily lives and the political baseball stuff they care less about. Okay, um, go ahead. So I think where we're really going to see that come into play is, is when the members come back to elect a new speaker. Okay. I think that, uh, you know, every election is a, a reaction to the, to the previous election. Um, after President Obama, we have President Trump. Um, so I think when we, and I'm not making that comparison with, with, with Speaker Bonin, but what I'm saying is that I think that when we come back to the House, I think both Democrats and Republicans are going to look forward to... Um, Someone who can work across the aisle, someone who's going to bring forward issues that are important to the state, not, not that are divisive, but that unite our, our house. Uh, there's always a, a saying uh, in the House that, uh, you know, it's not a Democrat issue or Republican issue. The enemy is the Senate. Um, <laughs> Hello, uh, enemy. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I, I think... We, I think we, we have to rein in the House. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, okay. that's what he means. Please. Um, so, so you know, I think I think it, that's where you're going to see the political impact, and I think I think people are going to really want people that that can uh, build coalitions, someone who has who has the experience in building coalitions, um, and and focusing on issues that are important to Texans. Uh, Mary, you mentioned you know the, some of the successes or some of the issues that people do care about. You mentioned the school finance HB three. How is that playing out now that it, you know it's signed, it's in effect? I mean, what, what are, what's the feedback you all are hearing? I mean, just either, either anecdotally or, or not, you know, things that people that you're talking to with respect to this infusion of money for public schools. Yeah, so um, I was really fortunate to be both on appropriations and public ed last session, which means HB three was literally my whole, all of my oxygen during session, and it was transformative. I came in in 2012 right after the legislature had cut. $5.4 billion to our local public schools. And in this last session, we put in six over $6 billion back. And we had a lot... It, it was unfortunate that we had to wait that long to put that money back, but it was great that we that we did that. And I but here's what I will say: across the state, because I've been able to travel across the state on this one issue, is that schools are grateful for it. They are excited for the next step. I think all of us who are in pub ed keep saying. HB3 was one step, and we still need multiple steps to do. For example, um, we increased the weight we put for special education. We put $85 million more million for special ed students. However, we know that's still not enough to the cost of educating our special education population. So we know that we have an advisory committee right now who's a, um, assessing what that cost needs to be. That, and I think the legislature will meet that cost once that committee comes back. We have the same thing for bilingual ed and comp ed. So we are going to now look at, we, we raise the bar for the state holistically. I hope that next session we're looking at how to educate a diverse population in the state. Senator Denise, before you, uh, another issue that obviously affects you know, everybody, you said you're, you're, the next committee is transportation? Yes. So what, I mean, talk about what El Paso needs, talk about you know, the gains that you all made with respect to that issue. I mean, you see cranes and construction all around. Is it yeah. enough? Is it too much? Is it too expensive? I mean, kind of run, uh, give us a rundown. You know, I, I have seen tremendous changes in the transportation arena. Uh, as some people may know, I was involved with a court of inquiry back in 1994 where we discovered that El Paso and other border communities were not getting their fair share of transportation funding. And that's what that investigation was all about. And I think when it was over, the conclusion was that indeed we were being shortchanged. As a result, uh, and, and incidentally, the tremendous education the community received about these issues and how the state operates and how it treats border communities, 
in addition to that value, I, I believe that uh, we were able to uh, start getting more funding than we had ever before, and it all culminated with uh, having Ted Houghton as the chairman of the Texas Transportation Commission. And my experience with the Court of Inquiry was that wherever the chairman of the tra or chairwoman of the Transportation Committee Commission resides, the funding goes up dramatically. Okay. And that was no different with us here in El Paso. Uh, and now we're back to where just a few uh, months ago, a couple of months ago, I believe, in the last uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting, uh, uh, Representative Ortega, who's not with us today, observed that uh, it seems like we're not getting our fair share of transportation funding again. And that uh, she's had a meeting with the with the chairman of the uh, chairman Bugs of the Transportation Commission, and and we all agree. I mean, I, I agree with it. I've looked at the numbers. Uh, there's no question. We still are not now again not getting our fair share. So it's an area that we need to continue uh, fighting for. Uh, we still have a lot a lot of needs here. Uh, I would like to see more mass transit, more public transportation available for our community, especially in the Lower Valley and down to Clint and other places like that, in order to really promote uh, uh, not only transportation, meeting transportation needs, but economic development as well. So uh, we have a ways to go on it. My concern on it is that it's a, it's a, it's a battle between more funding for transportation and public education. And so we need to be concerned about that. Representative Moody, uh, before we came on, we were talking about um, the census, looking forward to the sex census. I know it's, it's, a, I mean, it's a huge, it's always a huge issue every 10 years, but this seems to be a, a little bit more politically charged. So I want to ask if the state of Texas, uh, the legislature is, is doing enough to promote the census, if that's falling more on, on local governments and local representatives um, to sort of urge people to take part. No, no, we did not. We did not do enough as a state. You know, Representative Blanco had a bill, had a rider in the budget to fund a statewide complete count committee. Uh, that's something that we could have done. We could, if we were really serious about making sure that we counted communities like El Paso, mm -hmm. but not only just like El Paso, talk about the panhandle, very difficult places to count. They're gonna see decreases in their representation as well. And so, no, we didn't do enough. We passed that buck down to the local level. We have business business, uh, business members, we have uh, local government officials, are, we, have, we have a whole host of people trying to do it at the local level, which I think is interesting, walking out of a session in which we, there was a large conversation about how much we didn't trust local government to do certain things, and we wanted to take all this power away from them, didn't want them passing paid sick, didn't want them you know, looking for ban the box policies or, or making sure that, that the people had proper rest breaks at work. We didn't want local government getting involved in any of that stuff, but we want them in charge and pass the buck to them to make sure that we get counted in our decennial census, the thing that's gonna dictate our representation and our resources over the next decade, right. to me, I mean, those don't drive together. And so to me, when, when, you, when you drop the ball on that, as we did, that is a concerted effort to decrease, you know, to, to depress the count here in Texas. And I think if you're in leadership, that, was, that is a very short-sighted approach to, to where we need to go as a state. Uh, it's disappointing. I wish we could have done something better. I think Representative Blanco did a great job advocating for that at the state level. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to do everything we can here uh, from reaching out to our apartment associations to talking to our local business leaders to continue to advance the message because we've also had to re-educate people uh, to take the fear out of that conversation too. Uh, and that's, that's an important thing for us to do, but we were left to do it as a local government, and I think that that was the, the wrong way to do it. So I said, what's what's worst case scenario if, if you know there is an undercount? I mean, I think it's just so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, irresponsible of elected leaders to leave money on the table. Uh, when you look at California, their legislature pumped in 190 million dollars for a statewide complete count committee. So what does that ha what does that mean for us? Uh, a one percent undercount. Uh, equals $300 million loss. Things that go to transportation infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, public schools, um, uh, school lunch programs, uh, all kinds of things that, that impact our state, that makes our state economically competitive uh, with other, other states. And when, when states like California are putting all that money to making sure that uh, they have an accurate count and also receive uh, representation in Washington, D.C., that 
we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Um, and then going into a redistricting year, right? Like that, that uh, we're, we're about to go in and redraw districts. Oh, it's statistically known that Latinos are hard to count, mm -hmm. especially children. There were 75,000 children undercounted in Texas the last session, 75,000. Um, so, you know, we're leaving money on the table. I wish that it wouldn't be political. It's not a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. It should have been viewed as a Texas issue, a Texas versus the rest of the country issue. Uh, but the state really dropped the ball, ball on it. Mary, your, your district ends at the El Paso County line. I mean, after redistricting, there's a possibility it could expand. Is that right? Very, very big possibility. Okay. Uh, I mean, how far, how far north, how far? <laughs> <laughs> you got to go a ways to get population. Um, so, yeah, the, the, uh, Representative Moody just said you have to go a ways to get population. Right. So, um, the, we, we had redistricting here in El Paso a few, a few months ago or a month ago. And here's what we learned. That each district is roughly going to be between 185,000 to 197,000. Somewhere in because we don't really know the numbers yet, right? So, think of if we, th let's say the max. 200,000. That means El Paso would need to have 1 million people in the county to keep five state reps in our whole county. We know we're not going to be a million people, so that means me, Lie, um, uh, <laughs> we'll have to move out forward, okay, I mean, move out east. Okay, next county neck over, Hudsby County. And it's shrinking, right. and it has 2,000 people. Okay, Culberson, Jeff Davis. So really, in order to get population, I have to go to Valverde County, which is Del Rio. Um, luckily, I love driving and I have a truck. Um, uh, but, but that's what we're talking about. For us to keep the five state reps, A, we need to make sure every El Pasoan is counted because we need that number as high as possible. But B, the, for the fifth state rep, we're going to have to break that county line. Well, that's the, the problem for us is, you know, we, we're landlocked in terms of redistricting. There's, there's one county line on the way out of here. We can't, I mean, obviously, not that I know of, I don't think we can go into New Mexico, but, um, you know, but I mean, it's the only way to go. And with the, with the, with the, with the county line rule in, in redistricting, you have to hold, if you can hold a district in the county, it has to stay. So that's four. And there's only one place that so you can't stretch two out of the county line. It's just not the way it's, it can't be done. So it's, it create, presents a very complicated problem for us. To, to sort of keep on a the theme, um, you, obviously, Joe, you, you represent this area in the, in the west side, but you also have uh, Vinton, correct? Uh, Mary, you, you know, Clint, uh, Tornillo, Fabens, those areas, and, and the senator has a lot of small towns going out, um, you know, further to the east. What's, how have you guys helped rural, rural Texans? I mean, not just your, your areas, but I mean, what in the legislature happened, you know, did, did the rural folks, because they, they got a, a good beef about, you know, they seem like they get overlooked. So tell me what the rural folks can celebrate and what they can kind of cringe about. I mean, the biggest celebration we can do is that we prop, we passed we pass Prop 2. Um, it was my bill um, with the Senator Help Me and Senator Lucio, everybody here actually helped me. It was a bill to bring $200 million for water and wastewater infrastructure to rural and low-income Texas. We know rural communities are still struggling to have clean water, wastewater infrastructure systems, and the state stopped really providing some funding for that. We were able to re-engage that, reauthorize the money, and so that's a lot of money that we're gonna see rural Texas specifically benefit from. Well, and, and those funds, uh, there's only a true grant program yeah. for these funds. And so if you look back historically out in the northwest part of El Paso, so kind of Theo, Westway, Vinton, Anthony, they've all benefited, benefited historically from the EDAP program. So to the extent that we still need to uh, address water and wastewater issues in that area, in the area that I represent and significantly in, in, in Representative Gonzalez's district, uh, this is the best opportunity to fix those issues. Uh, your question seemed to me to be broader uh, than just the last session. You asked about rural areas and how, sure. how uh, we need to represent and how they're affected by the legislative process. Uh, and, and I think my colleagues have touched on some of the issues, but if you talk about health care and access to health care, uh, these are highly underserved areas, you know, high uh, health professional shortages. Um, my district goes all the way to Presidio. I cover Culberson, Hudspeth, Fort Davis, uh, Jeff Davis, and Presidio County. And those are big issues. Education, there's, even though we put some more money into education, there's always a concern by rural communities that... Uh, those school districts are not getting the level of funding necessary for them to really provide a, a quality education for their kids. I can just cite you the example of, uh, of the Fort Davis Independent School District in Jeff Davis County. They had to give up, and this was several sessions ago, give up all of their UIL programs, debate, drama, 
you know, the sports, all of that arts went out the window because of the lack of funds. And that continues to this day, even though as, as Representative Gonzalez pointed out that, uh, that we put more money into education, uh, we, in my opinion, I keep saying this, we are not doing enough. It, it just simply is not enough to address the needs that, are, that, that, that first give an equal opportunity to our kids in the border for, for a full uh, education. Secondly, that don't provide the business community with the talent, the, the training, the expertise to, for the 21st century economy jobs, technology, communications. Um, we, we may have funded dual language programs in the bilingual area, but we didn't fund 80% of the kids, which is 800,000 800, kids, uh, in the other bilingual programs. And so uh, this impacts not just us here, but um, even more so rural communities uh, in the border. And, and I, I, I just need to cite to you Steve Murdoch, our state demographer, who has always said for years and years that if we don't educate the fastest, youngest growing population, meaning the Latino population, kids in the border, then the state and the nation is not going to be able to compete in the economy. And so we still have a lot of work to do there uh, in terms of how we address issues, not only in the rural areas, but also in our urban centers like El Paso. The, the, the center's right. I mean, we did do a lot in public ed. We, we were, but Texas before HB3 ranked 48th um, out of all states and per people funding. Now we're at 43rd. So we still have a long way to go. We just filled the hole that we created in 2011. And so not only do we have to do it in K through 12, but we are also underfunding our higher education system at the community college level and at the university level. And so the senator is completely right. Like I want us to be grateful and happy for what we did, right. but there's still so much more to do. You uh, mentioned healthcare a couple times and I wanna, I wanna ask, there has been, um, I guess in, in recent memory, two things that, that people were concerned would affect people going to, to hospitals or seeking healthcare. One was uh, SB4, Sanctuary Cities, um, which passed, God, how long ago was that? Was it 2017, 2015? 2015. 2015? Okay. Um, and then more, more recently, the, uh, the public charge rule. 2017. Sanctuary Cities? 2017. Okay. I'll leave it up to you guys. Yeah, I get my sessions confused on. So. Um, but and then more recently, the, the public charge rule, right? They came down from the feds, and, and I'll ask you because you know you, your district includes the hospital there in, in Fox Plaza. Um, have you heard? Either, have you seen any evidence, or you, have you heard anecdotally that these two policies are, are keeping people away from seeking seeking access to healthcare? Yeah, I mean, uh, laws like SB four um, just are meant to create fear. Um, it's politics. Um, it's not helpful for our community. It, you know, especially in the state of Texas, when people need to seek um, access to health care at, at uh, UMC, there is a fear. Um, we're, we're seeing that in the census as well, right? Uh, folks aren't going to want to um, report uh, on census because they're afraid of being deported as well. Um, but yeah, look, uh, in terms of health care, I mean, the thing we, we can do right away is expand Medicaid. Right. Right, we're, we're one of the states that, again, leaving money on the table, there are over uh, a million people uninsured that, that could be covered uh, by Medicaid. 50% um, of adults uh, all along the Texas-Mexico border from El Paso all the way to Brownsville, 50% of adults are uninsured. Um, and then we have health care professional shortages uh, uh, from El Paso all the way down to Brownsville. So there's a lot that we could be doing uh, in terms of health care to, to, to making sure that our communities, such as El Paso, that is medically underserved, um, to create more doctors and, and, and nurses and things like that. But if we don't have a healthcare system that, that's providing uh, quality care or access to individuals, then 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 we're not doing a service for our state. Um, I think that that. But going back to the immigrant issue, yeah, I think people uh, are fearful, um, and those type of policies don't work. I think this last se uh, legislative session, we saw a lot of bills to repeal SB4. And I think that um, none, of, uh, none of those bills passed. None of those, a lot of those right. bills weren't brought up. Um, but I mean, um, you, guys, you guys didn't expect them to pass. I mean. Right, and, and I think that there was a, there was a concern uh, that the House would go back into a, a, a debate that divided the House, again, as, as SB4 did. It was very personal, it was very ugly. 
And I think that leadership uh, uh, in, in the House this time didn't want us to go down that path. So um, none of those bills uh, passed, and we're still having to deal with the effects of SB4 in our community as it relates to health care, as it relates to uh, the, the shortages in, in jobs. There are over 20,000 unfilled construction jobs in the state of Texas um, with unemployment uh, so low and the lack of, of, of uh, folks that are coming to, to work here in, in hotel industry and, and construction, it's not good for our economy in the state of Texas. So we, we've got to find a balance, uh, uh, making sure that Im when immigrants come, they're looking for work. Uh, they want to con be contributing to, to our economy. I think business needs the labor. Uh, so we've got to find a balance. I think one of the things that we have seen, now looking back, SB4, three years, four years later. And the Houston Chronicle had a really powerful article that talked about, and this is one of the things that we talked about as women in SB4 conversation, is how domestic violence survivors, because they would be fearful of law enforcement, would basically, basically let their rapists go. Because if you're an, un, un, an undocumented woman who is raped, and you're so scared of law enforcement that you do not call the police, you are letting that rapist go. And we talked about this. And the Houston Chronicle did an analysis to, say, to see if there was a decrease in rape um, reportings. And, the, and they're across the board for Latino people, specifically, specifically in immigrant neighborhoods, there was a decrease. That is attributed to SB4. And it's really sad that um, even though you said, well, there were some bills filed that didn't move, the one bill that did almost move was a bill that was going to create um, Make, basically make a safe haven for domestic violence shelters because we've just seen how the impact yeah. has really been negative. Sure. Let me, let me um, I'm, I'm going to depart a little bit because you're, you're focused on SB4. And by the way, sanctuary cities, for those people who may not know what that means, it's authorizing local law enforcement to enforce federal immigration law. It, it, it changed and, a lot. And, I mean, the first and, iteration was, and, you know, cops, you know, not well, asking. It's, now, now it's mainly the, the ICE detainer issue with county jails cooperating well, with law it's, enforcement. It's still, it's still in the general umbrella of local enforcement used for immigration purposes. We've talked about, we're talking about immigration. We talked about access to health care, education, transportation. I, I want to offer these observations because I think the topic that we're supposed to be dealing with is the Texas legislature and the border. Mm -hmm. uh, my observation over the years has been that the state of Texas generally has not invested in the border infrastructure that is necessary for not only the border, but for the state to progress, both from the standpoint of uh, economic development from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, providing better services to, to its citizens and so forth. It just simply has not done that. Uh, you can look at any area, whether it's transportation, whether it's education, both public and higher education, whether it's uh, healthcare, the, 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 the data shows that we don't get and I'm talking about the whole border, mm -hmm. including El Paso. Right. We don't get our share, fair, fair share of funding. We just simply do not. And that, it seems to me, is one of the more pernicious issues that the border has to deal with vis-a-vis -vis the state legislature. Second, the view that some people have in the legislature, including leadership, that the border is a dangerous place that it uh, is full of immigrants that are out here to do harm to people, again, penalizes the border in terms of its ability to progress in, 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 in the way that we should, uh, economically and otherwise. And finally, closely tied to this, is the attitude that, for some reason, the border is um, a liability, it's a problem. It's not an asset, it's not an opportunity. Despite the fact that we have some of the most creative people anywhere, in my experience, here on the border, that we have this relationship with Mexico and the trade that we depend on, both in El Paso and, and Ciudad Juarez, Matamoros, Brownsville, McAllen, Reynosa, all up and down the border, the two Laredos, 
we, we have got to change the perspective in our leadership, starting with our leadership, but also with the community at large about the border. The Congresswoman correctly pointed out this morning that there is this climate of fear that's being created by the rhetoric that is being used by our president, by some of our state leadership, and others in this country. Rhetoric that is harmful to Latinos, not just to the immigrants, harmful to us as citizens. And unless we start changing that perspective that the state has about the border and the way it invests on some of these issues, then I, I, I fear that the state is just not, as Steve Murdoch, again, has told us, our former state demographer, we're not going to be able to compete. We, we're, 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 we're viewed from a national perspective, and I would say even in many parts of the state of Texas, as a poor community, you know, low per capita income, which is true because of the lack of investment, right. uh, and, and on down the line. So I this wanna, is a wanna, change that needs, to, that needs to happen if we're going to see our institutions like UTEP, our medical school, uh, reach the levels that we should be at. Speaking of, of perception of the border, I mean, the, the most horrible and glaring example happened in, in August at, at Walmart, and I, I hate to come, have to come back to it, but it's, I mean, it's an important topic. It's still on everybody's mind. So I want to I ask about that. Um, the El Paso Times, kudos to the El Paso Times, they um, put out a, an op-ed recently saying, you know, that the state of Texas, the governor, should um, honor the, the Walmart hero, um, the gentleman that, you know, was, was being sought and you know came forward that they should honor him the same way that they honored the the gentleman from the uh, the church in, in white settlement is that the name of the, um I, I haven't followed up but the el paso times op-ed said um you know that there wasn't a response from from the governor's office um that speaking to folks about it that sort of seemed to reignite or, or reaffirm you know the fact that um nothing is really seriously going to be done after this this walmart thing and i, I want to ask you guys you guys are going to these the public safety commission meetings when the governor announced that you know he's having these round tables some people said okay that's a good step some people just rolled their eyes and said okay great we're going to have more meetings and nothing's ever going to get done so it brings up to speed six more than six months later what what's the progress lawmakers the governor's office is making on on these issues with with gun rights uh, Cesar, i think you just posted something yesterday day before yesterday about you know access to weapons and things like that so just give me a quick rundown first of all is the governor doing enough and second of all what 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 can we expect with respect to to change in gun laws gun policy if anything so in, let me say this there are two lanes to discuss what happened what's what has happened since uh, August 3rd, and I apologize, it's still very, I, I think it's always gonna be very difficult to talk about this. Sure. Um, one of those lanes is what have we done, to the senator's point, what have we done to challenge the hate that targeted our community on that day? Similar language about invasion, about casting immigrants in a negative light. What have we done to address that? And sadly, I think we are, we are not accomplishing uh, turning that dialogue around. We're not. When the Texas Tribune poll comes out the other day that says only 51% of Texans would accept refugees in our state, refugees that have gone through security clearance, that is a direct result of the hateful incendiary rhetoric about immigrants. That's the only reason why you'd see that low of a number on a question like that. Whereas in the past, of course, if someone's coming from a war-torn country, and many of these people aren't even from Latin America, right. uh, that of course we're gonna take them in. Of course we're gonna do our security vetting, but of course we're gonna take them in. This is a place where we're gonna, we're gonna be the best that we can be. That, in, that, in that lane, we are failing. In the other lane, when we talk about legislative changes, uh, on access to weapons, what I have heard time and again is we need to figure out ways to get weapons out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them, right? When we regulate weapons under Second Amendment case law, you can talk about the where, the who, and the what. To me, that sounds like the governor wanted to focus on the who. Who can we preclude from having weapons? There are multiple ways that we can do that. And the challenge that he gave us was to create a consensus 
around ideas on how to do that. We talked about domestic violence a second ago. We have the ability, and today in Texas, thousands of protective orders will be issued for people who have committed acts of domestic violence, who, by the way, have a higher propensity to engage in acts of mass violence and further acts of violence. That is statistical, that is data. That is not hyperbole, it is fact. We have the ability to remove weapons from those people's possession today, in law today. We just need to enforce it. You know, I hear the NRA and Texas State Rifle Association every time they say, well, we don't need new laws, just enforce the laws we have. So we did, we tried to do that last session. Say, hey, every county needs to figure out a gun surrender policy when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to stalking, when it comes to sexual assault, because that's the law now and counties aren't enforcing it. And you know what they said? Oh, there's a gun, they're gonna come in and grab your guns. So we need to take groups like that and set them to the side because they're not, they're not going to be a part of a proactive solution to taking weapons out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. We can enforce protective order laws in a smart, safe way. El Paso County is actually leading the way on this. El Paso County and Dallas County are the two counties that are trying to figure out how to do this. We can have federal, we can mimic federal law on straw purchases. We can mimic federal law on, on, on lie and try, right? We can bring those things into state law so that if the feds don't want to prosecute it, and they're not, we can. We can enforce, you know, this is one of the silliest things that we've discovered in this whole discussion is if you have an out-of-state warrant, I got a warrant in New Mexico for whatever, and I try to buy a weapon here in Texas, that's going to flag as a fugitive, fugitive from justice. You're going to be stopped on a background check, can't purchase that weapon. If you have the same warrant in Texas, in state, it's not going to trip that same wire. That is, that is an absurd result. But that is the law today until we change it. Now, I take the governor at his word. He said, build consensus and we'll pass the laws. The only thing he could do is call a special session. We've asked him to. I don't, it does not seem like we're going to go that direction. Sure. So our job is coming upon us to build consensus around these smart issues that when it, as, as, as single shot bills, they are, they are small and, they are, and, and they, are, they, are, they are narrow. But taken collectively, they will represent a sea change in the way that we get weapons out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them. Real quick, and, and I'll get to you. I just follow up that first lane, whose responsibility is it to bring us up to speed? You know, I mean, it's, it's not, definitely not the people of El Paso that are, you know, taking no. the dump on the border. I mean, we, I saw more unity and, and compassion in those weeks, and we still see it, you know, thankfully. Um, but so, so who, is, who is in charge at every level of, of changing that rhetoric? That's, so, so I, I, that's so, the governor. Yeah, well. You asked, you asked the question, I is think, the governor doing enough? Right. Excuse me, says, uh, the answer is absolutely not. Well, the governor and, is and, and, and it, it boils down to the issue of leadership. Mr. Hunt mentioned leadership and what role that plays in governance. The governor has not shown leadership, neither the lieutenant governor and others, on this issue. In the meantime, people are dying here in El Paso based on our race, our nationality. Uh, th this calls for action. This business of we can't do a special session reflects how serious our leadership is about doing something meaningful, meaningful about this. Joe had a red flag law right. in the House. I had it in the Senate. I've had it for the last three years. Folks, and, uh, and, and we I'm haven't sure. been able to, to get any, any support for it. So Safe storage bills, no support for them. I'm going so, to give them an, an opportunity to, to chime in here. And then, but if you guys want to start lining up to so, ask questions, please feel free. Whoever wants to go I, I think the, the, the key ingredient that's missing is, is courage. Because I think history is going to judge the elected officials who are dealing with this issue, who can deal with this issue. Uh, history is going to judge us. And I, my, my hope is that uh, we, we have all the ingredients um, to solve this issue. What's lacking is courage. What's lacking is... Uh, the courage to, to, to push up against the 15% in that poll that is pushing to, for the status quo. So our elected officials have to have the courage to take action. And that's what's missing from this piece. We have uh, Democrats offered 47 gun safety bills last session and none passed. Um, I, I have the bump stock ban, I have the internet loophole uh, bill, I have, we all have bills here that have, we have authored that are going nowhere. And meanwhile, in these hearings, uh, we're focusing on everything except the weapon of choice for mass murder, which is guns. But 
politicians want to talk about masks, they want to talk about video games, they want to uh, uh, talk at length on mental health, which is important, but it's creating a stigma. Um, they want to talk about everything else except the issue, which is going to affect their ability to get reelected. That's a failure of this generation of elected officials to take action, and it's unfortunate. But we have a chance. I'm hopeful that we can go before next session, if possible, or next session to take action, because blood is on the hands of elected officials who do not take action. You asked who is um, responsible for creating this cultural shift that we so desperately needed in society. Well, who built it? A, from the president to the lieutenant governor and the governor. And so what I would say, it's their responsibility to re retract or return to what, um, what they've, the problem that they've created or really um, added uh, more fire to, to. The other thing I will say is the way we can hold them accountable in that is by elections and voting. I mean, Joe, Representative Moody's right. Elections have really created a sea shift in the legislature. I feel that if there is a huge vote that comes out in this next in this next election, then we'll be able to get these common sense things done. But without there being an election that calls for that, um, it'll be so much harder for us to get these common sense things done. So the last thing I will say is um, August 3rd was obviously devastating and tragic for all of us in this room. But I couldn't be more proud of these people who are standing next to me and um, uh, sitting next to me, the delegation, we, we are just, we were, we've, we've been a team for the last two years. I think that we, uh, this, this, this situation just brought us even closer together um, through love and support, and I'm really grateful for the leadership that we have here in El Paso. Okay, thank you all. Uh, Ma'am, we'll start with you here on the, on the left side. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Lindsay Calvillo, and I'm from Northwest Early College High School. And I wanted to ask, what are some of the educational issues you feel are important for the next legislative session? And what resources can you provide for young Latinas like myself or other minorities to graduate from a four-year university? Mary, you want to take that? <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here. I love that. I love your question. So I'll give you three things. One is I think that if we're just, same thread of the August 3rd situation is we need to have a digital citizenship a curriculum that we've been trying to pass in the last session. A lot of young people are getting exposed to things on the internet and we assume that they will be able to understand that information as opposed to giving them the tools necessary to navigate some of the harmful rhetoric that they can find on the internet. So, so digital, digital citizenship. And the second thing we really need to do, and we've been talking about that next session possibly is going to be a higher ed session. The number one thing we can do in the legislature is actually fund, fully fund our institutions of higher education so that they don't put that they don't put that burden on the students. The number one reason students aren't finishing college is affordability. We can fix that. Well, and I think dovetailing with the higher ed conversation. So, we don't give a predictable landscape to institutions of higher education, right? The TRB system is I mean, it's great when we get it, right? It gives you that plum to get their tuition revenue bond. You build, you know, you can see these projects that, that we get from time to time, but that's not a way for an institution to run its budget, to, 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 to take a chance on the political, you know, political whims of, of the legislature to build something that's necessary on their campus. I mean, we, we got several projects that delayed for several years uh, relying on that. So I'm not saying that we want to turn that money away, but we need a more predictable way to, is that it's through formula funding or whatever that we have to do it. We have to have a more predictable way so the institutions of higher education can plan long term, right? That allows them to make sure that they are caring for their students in the way they need to. Uh, you know, that, that, that stability is something they don't have and they desperately need. Thank you for your question. Thanks for being here. Going over here. Yes, sir. What is the value of endorsing a candidate in a primary and does it affect the relationship with whoever ultimately wins the election? Sweet. I was, I was going to ask about endorsements and I didn't have time, so thank you for that. <laughs> What's the value? No, I, I think, you know, it, it actually shows who shares your values. I think, I think the value in it is, is elevating uh, someone who shares the values that you do. I think that is, a, uh, that is an important thing to do in leadership. Uh, it is not an easy thing to do at times. Um, I've certainly been on both ends of uh, of the of the of the endorsement uh, process, uh, but I think it's important if you want to to ensure that uh, the values that you have are going to be worked on cohesively and collaboratively. 
Speaking, uh, speaking of endorsements, Mayor, uh, Senator, I know that you, yeah. uh, in the mayoral race, you're backing uh, Ver Veronica Carvajal. Uh, she's, yes. you've been, you know, very instrumental in her campaign. Do, do any of you three have a candidate for mayor right now that you guys have? Mayor probably? Clint? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I live in Clint. <laughs> Who's the mayor of Clint? Dora Aguirre. Is this a pop quiz? No, no, okay. no, not at all. <laughs> no. Are you backing anybody for El Paso? I have not backed anyone. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. I'm squarely f focused on, uh, on, on March 3rd right now and ensuring that there are 12, uh, 12 Democrats that joined us as flippers last session uh, that, that flip seats in Texas House that will come back and be sophomores next session. That's what I'm focused on. You know, but, you know, oh, go ahead, Mary. But I want to add really quickly that the Senator, Representative Moody, and myself did endorse Elizabeth Warren in the presidential, everybody. Hint, hint. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of, I, you're the odd man out on that one, aren't you? I, I think Thanks, that... Um, uh, See, we don't agree on everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, we get you, hard you know, in the, in the political arena, one of the adages with regard to endorsements is that one who's elected already should not go around endorsing people because you're going to upset, you know, voters right. who may take it out on you at the next election. I've always had a very strong feeling along the lines of what Representative Moody expressed. We are in the political arena. We make observations about people's uh, qualifications, about their abilities, uh, whether or not they really are people who want to engage in genuine public service, whether they're in it just for themselves, for friends, uh, for different reasons. And so I feel strongly about making endorsements. I don't make endorsements on every single race, but I feel strongly about certain races which I think are crucial races. All of them, of course, are important, but you talk about the, the mayoral race, you talk about uh, House seats or Senate seats and on down the line. Uh, it's not just, in my view, a reflection of one's values, as Joe said, I agree with that, but it's also the view that we know some people, we've seen them in their work, their background, and versus the particular opponent that they're against, you conclusion is this person is much better qualified. And so I have no hesitation in, in endorsing or using some of my funds for some of those candidates. That's always been my, my view. I will say one quickly thing. I would not be sitting on the stage had the firefighters or Joe Moody or the senator not been part of my race. I mean, in the history of Texas, only 3% of the legislators elected have been women. Right? I think if we're going to talk about some institutional and structural changes we need, we need people who are already elected officials to use their voice to elevate people who maybe won't have access to these positions. Um, and so I'm, I'm all for endorsements uh, for the right people. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Redistricting will happen in the next legislative session. I wonder what you think the, possi excuse me, the possibility that you will draw maps based on geography and communities of interest instead of politics so that voters can pick their legislators instead of legislators picking their voters. Who, who, who wants in on that one? <laughs> thank, well, thank you very much yeah. for the question. I'm sure we'll be able to successfully remove politics from the redistricting process. <laughs> no, I, and, and, and Judy, I want to say thank you because the work that you've been doing yeah. uh, in our community to raise awareness about this process, yes. That's, that's the advocacy, that's the advocacy that, that, that matters, that, that shows people what the, the difference they can make, that, that one voice, one person can make a difference in this process. I don't think you're going to find anyone from, from our delegation in El Paso that is going to uh, thumb their nose at the Constitution and the rules that we have to follow in the Voting Rights Act when it comes to redistricting. Historically, at least in the last, you know, in the last round of redistricting, El Paso you know, was part of the litigation that went all the way to the Texas Supreme, or the United States Supreme Court. In terms, of the, in terms of the gerrymandering that went on here. We have to reject that. Uh, we, we have to look at things, we have to hear the testimony like you gave at the committee hearings here in El Paso. I'm on the redistricting committee. I have heard that similar testimony at 12 or 13 hearings across the state. We're gonna have 13 or 14 more before we go back to session. Uh, we need to actually not just take that testimony, but then empower those words through our legislation. Uh, Julian, if, if I might, Judy, I want to congratulate you, too, for the work you're doing in leading the effort here at the community level. We already heard about some of the issues we have faced uh, from the state leadership, and redistricting is just like the census. I mean, it's, it's uh, in my view, a political issue. It should not be, but it is, unfortunately. Um, 
my first freshman session, I introduced a bill to take the redistricting out of the hands of the legislators and put it in the hands of a commission, a bipartisan commission, as they have in some other states. Hopefully to minimize, it won't entirely eliminate the political considerations because in those commissions, usually the governor appoints the members of those commissions. They have them in California and other places. Uh, there was a former state senator out of San Antonio that joined with me in that legislation. We got a hearing, but that's as far as it went. The bottom line is that redistricting is used, whether it's currently the Republicans in power or the Democrats when we were in power, is used to maintain incumbents in office. That's the bottom line. So your question is a very critical one for our democracy in terms of fair representation. And, and it seems to me that as communities, we need to be advocating for changes in the way we do redistricting, not just here in Texas, but across the country, because you see it in the news, North Carolina, everywhere else. People use gerrymandering is another word that comes into play with redistricting, where lines are drawn in order to maintain the incumbents in office. I want to try to squeeze in two more questions here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so my question: We've talked about public ed. Um, what what issues do you feel um, are relevant for education here in El Paso, and how are you involving the youth in this conversation? How is El Paso different from the rest of the state? Joe, Mary, maybe. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're over here discussing it because, <clears throat> so I'll give an example. One of the things we were, I was looking at recently is um, Sada ISD, this next, after HB3 got $6,992 per student, per, student, uh, per water. Uh, Highland Park ISD got $7,400 um, per student per WADA. Highland Park's in Dallas, um, Dallas County. So we still, even though we are increasing funding, have a big discrepancy between where, you're, where you live and how much money you get because of property values. And so one of the things that I think we need to talk about is a kid in Isleta ISD is equally as important as a kid in Highland Park ISD. And so how can we start, because if you think of that, that's a $400 difference per, per year per child, right? And if you add in a classroom of 30, it starts to add up really quickly that discrepancy. And so one of the things I think we need to talk about um, and bring youth into the conversation is how can we encourage a more equitable um, funding system in the state of Texas that isn't just based on property values. And having and, and youth are the ones who are experiencing that discrepancy uh, more clearly in their classrooms. Thank you for that. Oh, we've got time for one more over here on the left. Uh, hi, I'm also a student from Northwest Early College, and my question is, how do we as a community combat the hate speech, the stigmas and the stereotypes that have been put on the Latin American demographic? So I think we, um, Number one, I think uh, the El Paso response to the, the massacre demonstrated to the world who we are as a, as a community. And I, and I think that our response with love, our response with compassion, coming together as a community to be responsive and helpful to those that are in need um, is, is important. Um, you know, when the shooting happened in Odessa, um, the first thing I did was text message um, State Representative Brooks Landgraf. And there's no, there's no instruction manual for elected officials when something like this happens. So you, you just, you, you learn as you go. And I sent him, I text, texted him the phone number for uh, Colonel McCraw, his cell phone to State Police, uh, some ideas. Uh, I'd let him know that there will be a, um, a family reunification center where family members will, will find out the fate of their loved ones. These are things that, that you don't know about. And I think uh, later on, when, when the dust settled in Odessa, um, he reached out to me and said, you know, uh, thank you. Um, uh, this was extremely helpful. I think, I think when we come together as a community and we demonstrate that love overcomes, that's the most powerful message to combat hate. 
Um, and we need to continue that. And I think that we need to continue that in our politics, in our political discourse. Uh, I think things have gotten off the rails in our country uh, on how we talk to each other. Um, and, and when we're having debates, it shouldn't, it, we, we should leave, lead um, with love and compassion rather than, than what we've been leading with as elected officials. Can, can, I, can, I, can I give another uh, side to this? Uh, there's no question, I think El Paso is a very welcoming, loving, and embracing community of peoples of all stripes. That's the first thing that needs to be said about us. And I think the shooting, as has been pointed out, demonstrated that. On the other hand, I frankly, personally, am concerned that there is very little outrage, little outrage being expressed about an individual coming in from out of town and killing people because of our nationality or race. It, it, it's in any other community, if you think about it, in any other community, if, if this happened because somebody deliberately wanted to come and kill Mexicans and Latinos, there would be tons of outrage and insistence on the part of the leadership in this state that something be done about this. Where is the outrage in our community? Sure. And, and so I, 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 I know it's, it's distinct from the expressions that Representative Blanco just expressed, which I share, but I think as a community, we, if other people are not going to stand up for us, and I have said for many years on this hate speech, on labeling the border as dangerous, as a, as a war zone, that all of us have got to speak up, and especially our business community. The business community has a big stake in this in terms of trade, commerce, economic development, and not having this picture of a community where there's danger all around us. Folks, unfortunately, we have to uh, wrap it up. We're going to get prepared for our next panel. So thank you all very, very much um, for being here. Thanks again to our sponsors, Las Palmas and El Paso Electric. And a round of applause, if you will, for our, our panel.